This is Linda Patterson Slayton. On the night of September 3rd, 1981, she was in her apartment getting ready for bed after playing cards at her neighbor's house. It was much needed fun to unwind from a long, rather emotional day. But she wasn't the only person in her bedroom that night. A monster was hiding. He had been waiting for quite some time now for Linda to get home. His eyes must have widened in excitement when she finally did. And when he came out of the shadows, Linda's world went dark and the light in her beautifully kind eyes went out. Linda was only 31 at the time, a divorced mother of two trying her best to create a good life for her boys, 12-year-old Timothy and 15-year-old Jeffrey. And chillingly, both were home at the time as their mother was being beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death in the very next room. Linda's family would eventually find justice, but decades would have to pass before science could reveal his face. And when it did, the betrayal alone was almost unbearable. Some still to this day have a hard time comprehending how twisted it was. My name is Killian, and welcome to True Crime Stories. Linda was born on March 8th of 1950. She was only 16 when she found herself pregnant with her first son, Jeffrey, the father being her boyfriend, Frank Slayton. Theirs was a tumultuous relationship, to say the least. Frank, from the brief articles written about him, was a troubled character that was described as a mean drunk to go along with various other addictions. Linda, loving her son with all her heart, just wanted Frank to do right by him, to have his father in his life so they could be a complete and cohesive family. But she practically had to beg and guilt Frank into doing the right thing. But she got what she wanted, as they would be married later that same year. She had persisted and created herself a happy little family, and three years later, she would have her second son, Timothy. Her boys were growing healthy and strong, and Frank was laying off the booze. Until he didn't. Soon there would be a name for daddy when he had a few too many, and that simply was the monster. Linda, Jeffrey, and Timothy all got their fair share of beatings and verbal abuse when the monster wasn't feeling too happy, and she would stay with Frank much longer than anyone would have liked. But abusive relationships could be complicated. But after nine agonizing years, Linda finally had the courage to take herself and her boys away from Frank and officially divorced him in 1974. Now as a single mother with little earning power, she found herself struggling to even put food on the table. Her sons had to beg friends and neighbors for rides just to get to school. But Linda was a strong woman that never gave up and she always did the best she could and her boys noticed and were grateful for her efforts. But not always, especially her eldest son, Jeffrey. Remember when I said that Linda was looking forward to unwinding from a long emotional day? Well, the emotional part was a nasty argument with Jeffrey. 15-year-old Jeffrey Slayton found an escape from his troubles in the game of football. He and his brother had made the high school team and the camaraderie was a needed contrast to his fractured home life. But being that his mom couldn't afford a car, he and his brother had to solicit rides just to make it to practice. But thankfully, they had a coach named Joe that was more than happy to drop them off on his way home. So on the day Linda would be murdered, the boys would be dropped off after practice, tired and hungry, only to find that there was literally nothing to eat in the house. Jeffrey, being annoyed, was rude to his mother. He would have some harsh words, and Linda, feeling the disrespect, dished it right back. The shouting match wound up having no resolution when Jeffrey stormed out of the house, hopped on his bicycle, and rode over 10 miles to his grandparents' house, where he had dinner. At around 9.30 p.m., 
Jeffrey returned home to find his mother and brother not there. Linda had taken Timmy to the neighbor's house to enjoy some card games. The two wouldn't come home until 11.30 that night. So now we reach the time frame in which Linda enters her bedroom. We know what happens, so let's forward to 8.30 a.m. the following morning. Here we meet Linda's sister, Judy, knocking on her front door. The two are very close and would frequently enjoy their mornings together with a hot cup of coffee. She waited for her sister to open, but nothing. She knew Linda was an early bird, always up before the boys, so she knocked again. She soon figured her sister went out early to do chores or whatnot, so she turned to leave. Then she saw something that was odd, and when the reality of what she was looking at sunk in, it sent a chill down her spine. She saw that Linda's bedroom window was wide open and the screen was taken off. She walked over to that window. A caretaker working on the property heard Judy's scream shatter the quiet morning. A scream so heartbreaking, he didn't hesitate to call 911. In a matter of minutes, the Lakeland police would be taping off the crime scene. 12 year old Timothy as he was being escorted out by the police, looked into his mother's room and saw her lifeless body with the clothes hanger around her throat. Jeffrey, on the other hand, did not look. Detectives found Linda's body partially dressed with scratches and bruises on her neck, arms, and shoulders. Coroners would later identify the order of Linda's attack. First, she was brutally beaten, then raped, and then strangled with a metal clothes hanger. Besides the physical evidence on and within her body, the only other evidence that was key to detectives in 1981 was an unidentified palm print on her window. As they dug into Linda's past, Frank Slayton, the alcoholic ex-husband stuck out like a sore thumb. A reported history of physical abuse seemed right in line with what they were looking for. One story cropped up of a time when he strangled Linda in front of the boys with a gun to her head. He was taken in for questioning and things were very promising for detectives. Except they couldn't make his whereabouts fit the time of the crime. They kept digging, but simply couldn't disprove that he was over 500 miles away in Alabama. Detectives had to let him go, but kept Frank Slayton in the back of their minds regardless. It was then some troubling bit of information was learned about Jeffrey Slayton, the victim's own 15-year-old son. He and his brother were now living with their grandparents when he was called in for questioning. He claimed to love his mother, but others would describe it as a rather distant kind of relationship, always teetering towards an argument. Being the eldest son, he was especially tormented by his abusive father, and with that being known, was there resentment towards his mother for not saving him and Timothy nine years of abuse? And was it just a coincidence that he and his mother had one of their biggest fights and just so happens she dies the same night? It was a horrible thought for anyone to imagine, considering Linda's autopsy confirmed a sexual assault. Of course, Jeffrey denied hurting his mom in any way. He claimed that he found her washing dishes in the kitchen just before bed and he apologized and she kissed him goodnight and they said their I love yous. Detectives made him take the lie detector test twice on two separate occasions. Jeffrey passed both times and they had to cross him off the list. Then a new piece of information was intriguing as well. Linda had a boyfriend at the time, but his alibi was rock solid and from most accounts, he was good with her and the boys. So he was quickly crossed off the list of prime suspects, leaving detectives running low on leads. And then detectives hit a wall, and the case would grow colder and colder every year. And it would be this way for decades. Then, 20 years later in 2001, DNA technology had advanced. The DNA from the killer had now been sequenced, and all that was left was the hard part, finding a match. Then the police got a tip that seemed long overdue. At around the time of Linda's murder, back in the 80s, there was a man named Jimmy Ulmer 
who committed a crime similar in nature. The difference was, the victim was a 10-year-old girl and he nearly killed her, attempting to kidnap her through her bedroom window. But the most promising information was when they timelined his whereabouts against Linda's murder. They found that he was staying with a friend that lived at Linda's apartment complex. Police were certain they had their man. Unfortunately, Jimmy Ulmer had already died while serving an 80-year sentence and the only way to get his DNA now was to exhume his body. Jimmy's mother allowed the police to dig him up and the results no doubt shocked everyone when there was no match. Detectives then figured why not just test every person on that original suspect list. They found Frank Slayton, now well into his golden years, who was now also clean and sober. They tested him, but he didn't match. The boyfriend at the time, no match. Neighbors, friends, acquaintances, altogether dozens of tests, all no match. Now let's talk about the Slayton boys. When they tested Timothy Slayton, no surprise, no match. But Timothy did share his story about life after the murder that would in time prove an essential part of the case. So just two weeks after his mother's murder, the gears of life would grind back into some semblance of normality for Timothy. They started going back to school, but most importantly, their football team. Timothy and Jeffrey found tremendous support from their teammates. Coach Joe would take the grieving boys under his wings, drove them where they needed to go and making sure they always had a ride to practices and games. He had become somewhat of a father figure to the boys, especially for Timothy, who had hung the team photo in his room proudly as a reminder to stay strong and never give up, something their mother used to always remind them. Now let's get back to 2001, where next in line to get tested is Jeffrey Slayton. Remember, detectives back in 1981 had to scratch him off the list because he passed two polygraphs. But knowing what we know now about these machines as being unreliable, they probably wouldn't have taken that 15-year-old athlete off the list so readily. And the record showed they really liked him as the killer. They actually hounded him frequently about his mother's murder, even ordered him to do unconventional things like hypnosis, as well as good old sheer intimidation, saying things like, you got big arms on you. You could easily put your hands around your mother's neck and kill her. And who could forget the coincidence of a fight in the same night? Your mom ends up dead. And when the DNA results came back, it proved that the 1981 detectives were right to take him off the list because he was not the killer. And just like it did the first go round, the case went cold again for another two decades. In 2019, enter C.C. Moore, a renowned expert in the field of investigative genetic genealogy. She learned the tragic story of Linda Patterson Slayton and the two boys who were robbed of their mother, who were now men who had successful careers and created families of their own, but still held on to so much pain, knowing their monster was never caught. Moore's model simply is, if you have that DNA, there is no reason you cannot solve that mystery, whatever that mystery is. She was pleased to see that some forward-thinking criminologists 40 years ago had gathered and preserved a rape kit containing the killer's DNA at a time when no such technology was even around to decode it. She began by uploading the DNA to genealogy websites to locate relatives, if not the killer himself. She then began the tedious task of constructing a family tree, branch by branch, making connections via birth certificates, marriage licenses, obituaries, and social media. And slowly, but surely, the tree would start to grow and populate with names. She would eventually uncover three immediate branches of the killer's family. She would keep narrowing things down until she was down to just one branch, to just one family. The DNA had already confirmed that it was male DNA, and this family had only one son. His name 
was Joseph Clinton Mills. But back then, he was just a 20-year-old kid and simply known as Coach Joe. The same Coach Joe that continued to drive the boys around after their mother's murder. The same man that gave them sage advice about life, becoming a father figure for them, was the same man who killed their mother, whose picture was hanging on their wall this whole fucking time. So, a day after the murder, Coach Joe was interviewed by the police, but it was only by phone, indicating that he was not a suspect whatsoever. But if you take a little time to think about it, he was the man that drove the boys around, almost daily, parking directly in front of the house, most likely seeing Linda and liking what he saw. And he definitely dropped them off the day of the murder. So why didn't investigators think to take a closer look? It was probably because they already had their biases towards the ex-husband Frank Slayton and especially poor Jeffrey Slayton, who was not only a confused 15-year-old hurting from losing his mother, but also dealing with the constant harassment of detectives who plainly displayed that they thought he killed his own mother. So what does Coach Joe, now 58, have to say about it when finally confronted by police 38 years later. Of course, he denied everything, ever being in the house, let alone Linda Slayton's room, stating, I picked up the boys, stayed in the vehicle. I don't recall going in or out of that house, ever. Little did he know, because he had a little brain. He was saying exactly what detectives wanted him to say. So now what does he say? when they present him with the DNA evidence from Linda's rape kit. He said okay, that they've had consensual sex, but he's still never been in that house. Needless to say, Coach Joe was not a very smart man. So now they bring out the nail for that coffin, which was in the form of good old fashioned police work, which was the palm print lifted off Linda's windowsill that happened to match his Exactly. So what does a cornered idiot say now? He decides to disgrace the memory of his victim by trying to shame her. That it was consensual sex inside Linda's room, but she had a kink. She placed a clothes hanger on the neck herself and asked him to apply pressure as a sexual act. He accidentally went too far and she died which is completely preposterous considering no other man in her life ever knew her to have such a fetish. Plus, that still doesn't account for Linda's head injury, which was sustained even before she was raped or strangled. The sheer amount of force used on a woman that was barely 100 pounds was no doubt meant to kill. They had him dead to rights. Joseph Mills pleaded guilty to all charges, including first-degree murder, sexual battery, and burglary. He was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jeffrey and Timothy still hold on to a lot of guilt about their mother's death, even though it was out of their control. Jeffrey, who was sleeping in the living room that night, felt he should have heard something, considering how violently his mother died. And as he used to try to protect his mom from their abusive dad, he would have gladly did the same if he just woke up. Timothy Slayton, when he learned who the killer was, thought back on when he held Coach Joe with such high regard and even having a picture of that bitch on his wall made him sick to his stomach. And don't forget, he was able to remain free for another 38 years, and in this case, I'm sorry to say, could have been solved as quickly as the next day. Detectives seem to have had tunnel vision caused by that dangerous practice of falling in love with a theory. If they had just taken the fingerprints of a man who was clearly intertwined in Linda's life, the case would have been closed because in that 1981 investigative team, they had a man named Sergeant Edgar Pickett who was a legend in fingerprint analysis. One simple fingerprint from Coach Joe against a palm print lifted by Sergeant Pickett himself at the crime scene. Then Coach Joe could have never borrowed 
that extra 38 years. Jeffrey and Timothy will continue to carry the memory of their mother in their hearts. And hopefully, they found the peace they need to lift any burden left by that monster that robbed them of their childhood. My name is Killian. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to support the channel. Now go and protect the ones you love and love the ones that protect you.